Well, thank you so much for coming to this uh, event today. We've had some terrific programming all week, um, and this is just yet another topper. Uh, this shows about podcasting. How many of you folks do podcasting currently? Awesome. Uh, okay. How many of you aspire to do podcasting? Pretty good amount, yeah. All right. How many are students? Okay. How many are just here to make a phone call or do your email? <laughs> <laughs> or sit down yeah okay cool well you have a very special treat today from focus right we have mr dan hugley who is going to show you how to be a, an expert podcaster he did the similar presentation last year and it was hugely popular and so here we brought him back again this year and uh let's give him a warm round of applause dan hugley thank you everybody let's give it up for glenn and the aes for having all of this for us all of this education is great and something that i really admire about the aes uh, is, you know, they give us the opportunity to come speak with people like you. And, you know, it wasn't long ago that I was in these seats where, where you're sitting right now. So, uh, you know, it all comes full circle. Even speaking yesterday uh, on the podcast with uh, the current president of AES, uh, she told me that, you know, uh, 20 years ago, she was sitting in these seats. And little did she know that, you know, 20 years later, she's going to be the incoming president in January of AES. So you never know where your career is going to take you. And, uh, you know, just just keep that in mind, you know, keep working really hard and, and that's where you can get. But that's not really what we're here to talk about today. Podcasting. Uh, good show of hands. That's a great that's great that so many people have a podcast already. Um, that That's great news. Um, and like I said, Glenn introduced me, Dan Hughley. I'm the U.S. marketing manager for Focusrite and Focusrite Pro. Uh, and I've been leading um, the company's charge into podcasting. Um, and it's kind of a funny story about how that all came about. See, um, my manager uh, a couple years ago at the NAB show told me to go uh, to the podcast pavilion because one of the uh, pioneers of podcasting was going to be doing a presentation there and he was going to be, um, uh, he had a booth and she wanted me to talk to him, learn a little bit more about podcasting. And like a lot of uh, people that are musician, audio engineer backgrounds, I was like, what? I, I don't want to do that. First of all, it was ridiculously far away. Um, <laughs> If you've ever been to the NAB show in Vegas, that's an enormous convention center. Um, you have uh, three giant halls. We were in the middle of the central hall. It was like a mile and a half to go walk to this thing. After being on your trade show floor all day, I was exhausted. I was really kind of pissed off that I had to go do this, but you know, uh, the manager wins every time. <laughs> and I, you know what, to be honest, I'm really glad I did. Um, not because of the first person I talked to, because to be honest, he shut me down immediately and made me feel even worse about the whole situation. I was even more uh, deflated, my feet hurt. I had just walked like a mile and a half over to this giant hall and, and here this guy immediately shuts me down. And he's supposed to be the guy, the guy. He knows all of this, he has all of this knowledge about podcasting. I didn't know he was, had a reputation of kind of being a jerk. Um, so learned that a little bit later. Uh, since I was already over there, um, I decided to go ahead and uh, speak to some other people because they had a podcast pavilion, um, which was really cool. So I went and talked to some other people and literally everyone else I talked to loved our brand, loved our products, and were really happy that someone from Focusrite came over there. So uh, that got my world started into podcasting. And to be honest, at this point, it is pretty much my passion. Uh, I, I had been listening to podcasts for a long time, um, but I, I didn't put two and two together that you record podcasts. I don't know why as an audio engineer, I didn't understand that, but uh, I think a lot of people were of that mentality. Um, but a lot of you currently know what a podcast is. Uh, the Oxford, uh, the new Oxford American Dictionary defines a podcast as a digital audio file made available on the internet for downloading to a computer or mobile device. It's typically available as a series, new installments of which can be received by subscribers automatically. Basically, iPod, which was the first medium to listen to them, plus broadcast equals podcast. Um, so I learned a lot about podcasting, putting this presentation together. This is the first time I've actually gone through this presentation uh, for an audience. So uh, I want to point out some of the history of podcasting, just so you know. Um, in 2004, Adam Curry and Dave Weiner, they're the ones, they're pod fathers, the, <laughs> the ones credited with, um, with coining the phrase and inventing the term podcast. Um, um, later on in 2004, uh, Liberated Syndication, or what we now know as Libsyn, was created. And um, they were the very first uh, podcast service provider. 
Uh, just a short time later, um, uh, Apple knew what they did, right? So uh, the iPod, um, iTunes 4.9 was released and there were podcasts included for the first time. We're gonna come full circle on that one, but I'll get to that. Uh, we have some breaking news on that uh, towards the end of my history here. Um, so then again, one year after podcast inception, the Oxford American Dictionary coined it as the, 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 the most looked up word of the year in 2005 which is incredible for the medium. Uh, 2006, our good friend Steve Jobs d demonstrated, you guys remember this keynote when he stood up in front of everybody uh, with GarageBand and showed everybody how to create a podcast on your iPhone. And I think that really opened the world up. Um, a lot of people realized what they can do. And to this day, GarageBand is still one of the DAWs that a lot of podcasters use, mostly because of uh, the low cost entry with it or the free. Um, then 2009, everybody knows Mark Maron, right? The W2F radio show. Um, but in 2009, his, um, he, was, he was canceled off the radio, um, as, as it is. Um, but then uh, he went on to open a podcast studio in his garage in Eagle Rock, California, not very far from where I live. Uh, and he's had some of the most incredible guests, including uh, President Obama when he was president, visited Mark Maron's garage in, uh, in Eagle Rock and, and recorded a podcast there. Um, 2013, uh, Apple has a billion podcast subscribers. That's a lot of people, you know, that, that's a lot of subscribers to podcasts. Um, moving up to, uh, more current events, which this isn't even, it, the funny thing is this isn't even the breaking news part where this has been the year of podcasting. Uh, last year I had the pleasure of meeting the people from Gimlet Media, uh, who have a, a fantastic studio in Brooklyn. Um, we have a great story about them on our website. Look up Gimlet Media. They used a lot of Focusrite gear in that. Um, but I'm really not here to talk too much about Focusrite. I really kind of want to talk about podcasting. Um, so Spotify acquired Gimlet and Anchor, which is another uh, hosting platform, for $340 million, combined $340 million. And by the end of this calendar year, they've uh, committed to invest another $120 million in the medium. Now, that's a lot of money. Um, half, half a billion dollars in podcasting is... It, it, it says to me that this isn't going away. This is only going to get bigger. And it makes it should make all of us as podcasters feel better about what we're doing because people are dropping a lot of money into the medium. Um, another great statistic, uh, this is just in the last month, this was announced that um, NPR projects that next year, for the first time in their history, their uh, podcast revenue is going to surpass their broadcast revenue. NPR is a national public radio and now podcasting is going to be their major revenue stream so another big piece of money advice there um, and this is brand new um, this is just from last week uh, variety shared uh, that there's a new form factor for podcasts which is going to be the, the future so there's been a, a a tough adoption of smart speakers and podcasts mostly because of the length right i mean how many of us have 45 minutes 30 minutes to sit and listen to a a podcast in our smart speaker. We're usually, if we're listening to music on our smart speaker, we're traveling around. So um, now with um, Spotify giving us the ability to put podcasts into playlists, so we can have songs and podcasts in our playlist at the same time, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's giving musical artists a chance to create something called microcasts or a seven to ten minute podcast. Um, just to, you can put about your content. You know, um, an artist comes out with a great new song. A lot of us, you know, as audio engineers, we want to hear about that song, right? So you can put it in your playlist now, you know, like let's hear Bruno Mars' new album and then let's hear Bruno Mars talk 10 minutes about how he created that album. That's kind of cool. Um, another uh, recent uh, piece of current events is uh, with Mac OS Catalina. Uh, now podcasting is going to have its own app. It's separate from iTunes. So we've come, that's where I'm saying we come full circle from uh, update 4.9 to to the current OS Catalina, it's uh, it's come a long way in just, what is it, 14 years. Um, so it is, and, and that is the thing, it's a very fresh medium, 14 years old. It's, it's not very old at all. And what is a presentation without some charts and graphs? So we have to have some charts and graphs, right? Um, just really quickly, I'm gonna go through some of these stats and then I'm gonna get into some more of the, the nuts and bolts of things. Um, so just to show the impact, now some of these numbers are, are a little bit disputed, but the solid number of podcasts in 2018 was 550,000 shows. Um, and then in 2019, 
that's 700,000 shows. So a year over year increase of 150,000. Um, and the reason those numbers are a little bit disputed is that the amount of active podcasts. Sure, we all agree that there are 700,000 podcasts currently, um, but uh, a number that I was just given by uh, the head of Libsyn is an estimate of about 250,000 active shows. So there's about a quarter million active shows currently. Um, so the number of episodes doubled year over year from 2018 to 2019, from 18 and a half million to 29 million episodes in just one year. So that's a lot of fresh content in just a short period of time. So people are recording these podcasts. Um, here's one more. This is good. You always like to see the charts and graphs. I know our financial people at, at Focus right love, love to see when the charts and graphs go up. Um, there were a couple of anomalies um, in 2012 through 2015 uh, due to some measurement uh, changes, uh, but you can see there was a steady increase. Um, so the criteria for measuring podcasts changed quite a bit through there. Um, so from in 2006, 11% uh, of the population listened to podcasts. And then by 2014, that increased to 20% of the population. Um, and then just this year, over half of the population are podcast listeners. So it's no surprise that with the number of shows and episodes that are available, there's something out there for everyone. Like we all have something to talk about, right? Like, uh, you know, someone from, um, we all know Patreon. Everybody know what Patreon, the, the, fund, the crowdfunding source. Um, I was at Patreon last year, which is a convention that they have very small for their, for their it's funny, it's for their, um, their members that have, that have made $500,000 in a year or more. So it's a very exclusive group. Um, and one of the pieces of advice, um, kind of going off script here. One of the pieces of advice that they gave to get more people is everybody has a hundred people out there in the world that will give them $5 a month. Everybody has that. We can all talk about something. It doesn't matter what you do if you're a photographer, videographer, if you're a podcaster, content creator of some kind. We're all weird enough that someone else is just as weird as us and they want to read or hear what we have to say. So um, there's something out there for everyone. And this, that's what this shows, is all of these people are hungry for content, and they're hungry to get it in their ears. Um, so a, a little bit more about awareness. This is my last charts and graphs, I promise. Um, so the awareness, 17 million more people in the US are aware of podcasting this year than last year. 20 million more people in the US have listened to a podcast than they did last year. 17 million more monthly podcast listeners. So people that identify as a monthly podcast listener. Um, are we all monthly podcast listeners? I'd assume. Do we all listen to podcasts? Yeah. I, I don't even listen to the radio anymore. I've stopped listening to music. I don't know. I, I end up binging a lot of shows. Um, but there's 14 million more weekly podcast listeners. All right. Now, the how do I get started? That's the big question, right? Like, and like I was saying, there is something out there for anyone. You can choose your genre. You can choose from pretty much anything. There's not a shortage of options. Um, but there could be a, a strategy to choosing your genre, right? Like um, true crime. We've all heard of true crime serial, uh, Up and Vanished, uh, Atlanta Monster. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of really great true crime podcasts out there. Uh, that's actually what I've been binging a lot lately. <laughs> I can't stop. Um, it really helped that uh, when I met... Um, one of the producers uh, from Tenderfoot TV, the producers of Up and Vanished, uh, found out that they used a bunch of the same stuff that I use and watched one of their videos and saw a lot of the same stuff in the videos, which was really cool. So true crime, if you want a, if you want a built in audience, find, find something like that. Uh, find a true crime podcast or um, a new TV show. You know, let's let's start a Game of Thrones uh, Gabfest show. And everybody loves Game of Thrones, right? So or. Uh, <laughs> The, the Law & Order SVU, the Special Viewing Unit. So people sit down and make fun of the Law & Order episodes as they're being aired, which is, uh, which is kind of fun to hear them just making fun of like, you know, outfit choices and you know, how someone entered a room and things like that. They're critiquing the weirdest things about Law & Order. Um, but there's a, a few basic structures to podcasts. Um, I, I mentioned Gabfest, and it's just basically your buddies sitting around in a room, right? Like sitting around the table like you do and maybe you're having a beer or something like that and you get passionate about a topic. Maybe it's a sports team. Maybe it's um, the new records. And maybe it's, uh, you know, all the cool stuff you saw here at AES. Um, but that could be a great podcast. That could be a great podcast episode to sit down here and talk about what you saw here. Um, another one is an interview style, which is um, our, our podcast, the Focus Right Pro podcast, is an interview style. We sit down with guests and it's just a back and forth conversation, minimal editing, um, but we, uh, like we did yesterday, we had some great high profile guests on. We had the, the 
excuse me, the president of AES, the uh, executive director, a whole bunch of great people from AES, as well as some uh, prominent audio engineers with 40 years behind them uh, in the industry. Uh, and then storytelling, like that would be um, anything from fiction to nonfiction. You can um, have a great story and tell it. And uh, the cool thing about that is really you can design it any way you want. You can structure your, your storytelling podcast pretty much any way. And it, you know, you tell a story. It could be a short story that you finish it by the end of the episode. You could draw that out every season or the whole series. You know, you could have cliffhangers just like television shows and go on to your next season after you, you know, take a break for the holidays or whatever you take a break for. So why are people going to care about your podcast? If you're passionate, if you're interesting, sorry, I, I feel like we need a, I feel like I'm way popping here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> if you're passionate about your topic, see, step back. And, uh, and you're interesting, people are going to listen to you. You're going to find that audience, but you need to work for it. And it is not easy for a podcast. Personally, I took on that responsibility. I'm, my, my schedule is super busy before the podcast. I said, oh, it'll be fun. It won't take that long. I'm an audio engineer. I can just cut up. It's just one track, right? Cut it up. Easy. No, it's not. It takes a lot of time. We know this, right? Like, but I love it. It's, it's great. I'm editing audio and I'm having a great time with it. Uh, build your structure and stick to it. That's really important for a couple of reasons. Your audience will expect it. And then when your fatigue of creating your sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth episode, you already have a structure in place. So you know where your intro goes. You know where the questions are. You know how your show is going to flow. And your audience does too. So that gives you something to fall back on. So when you're having trouble putting something together, you have the A, B, C, D, just like a song. You know, you have your verse, chorus, bridge, all of that. It all falls into place. It's very similar in podcasting. Planning your content is extremely important. Um, that is one of the most important things is to have a roadmap. Um, you can't just go episode by episode. You need to have six or eight episodes canned up before you launch your podcast. Otherwise, you're going to pod fade. You're going to have two episodes and you're going to be done. And you're going to be part of the statistic of the, um, the, the half a million shows that are no longer active. Um, I read, a going back on that, uh, The Podcast Planner is a great book. It's a workbook. Uh, it has a lot of great advice in it. Uh, it was written by my friend Addie Saucedo. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, it's helped me with what I do. Um, there's a lot of worksheets, checklists for every show. Um, she gives great advice on how to keep yourself going um, when, you know, the fatigue sets in because it is hard work. It's hard work getting guests. It's hard work interviewing guests. Um, the technology, luckily, is pretty pretty simple. That's the easy part, but it's uh, getting it all done. That's, that's a little bit of a problem, but... One, of the, one thing, good audio quality. How many of us have heard a crappy sounding podcast? And I've turned them off even though I love the content. Um, I, I, it hurts me as an audio engineer and, and us especially being in, at the Audio Engineering Society. Like we know, we have trained ears. A lot of people don't. Like my wife doesn't have trained ears and she doesn't know what a bad podcast sounds like. So great. Um, but there are people like us that will turn off a podcast even if it's good content just because it hurts our ears. And the great th one of the greatest things is the community behind podcasting. If you need help, if you ask a question, you will get an answer. Uh, there are plenty of Facebook groups. Um, I, I'm in them all the time. There are a lot of other manufacturers. And the great thing is we all work together. We're peers. We're not, we don't feel like we're competitors in there. We all work with each other and off of each other, which, which is really a fun, um, a fun feeling to have all of that. Uh, the community is great. There are a lot of events. It was funny. I didn't know there were podcast specific events. You know, I was at the NAB show and they had a podcast pavilion. I thought that was it. But then when I dig deeper and there's event almost every month, uh, there's local events, um, a lot of regional events and even monthly meetups for your area. Um, I know New York's got to have several of them. Los Angeles, where I live, there's plenty of meetups. I was just at uh, a podcast movement meetup where it was funny. I think I know a lot of the people in the area, but I got there. I didn't know anybody. And there were all of these people. And um, it, it was incredible how many people actually showed up to this one brewery on a random Tuesday night in Los Angeles and, and, and sat down, had a beer together and talked podcasting. It was really, really cool. And there's no shortage of these events. Um, you know, the podcast movement is a great one. Podfest is great. If you want something a lot smaller, uh, watch for Outlier Podcast Festival. It's a regional show. So it travels all over. Uh, the next one that's going to be close to here will be Columbus, Ohio. I think that's going to be in April or May. Uh, but just check their website or follow them on uh, social media and they'll get going. And just don't give up. Like I said, if you're passionate and interesting, 
people are going to listen to your show. People will find you. But again, you have to work at that. And I'll, I'll cover how you can work at gathering followers and finding followers in, in just a few minutes. So how do you report, record a podcast? So it's a lot like audio engineering. You need a nice, quiet place. You need a nice, quiet room uh, to, uh, to work in because you don't need distractions. Like here, what we're hearing right here, we have headphones on. That comes over the mic. Um, we re not taking my own advice. I'm recording our podcast here from the booth. So uh, forgive me if my voice is cracking. I've recorded, I've had nine interviews in the last two days and we have a few more this afternoon. So my voice is going to be completely shot by the time we're done with all of this. And uh, you got to drink a lot of water. Um, of course, no outside loud noises. Make sure you turn off your phone and everyone in the room's phone. I'm, I've been guilty of this. I'm sure we all have. I had a guest yesterday whose phone rang while he was uh, being interviewed and it was a good interview. So I, I'm, I'm never going to tell a guest, you know, in the middle, you know, I'm not going to scold them. I did ask him if he had to take it, <laughs> but you know, that's fine. Um, if you still hear noises, um, there's really cool treatments available. Oh, where did that go? My picture didn't pop up. Huh. Oh, there it is. Sorry. There's sound treatment available. Uh, there's a company called Audimute, um, and they make custom designed uh, uh, treatments for your room. Uh, they have really cool things that uh, they resemble like a, um, 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 like a shade that you pull over your window, but it's, uh, it's thick and it'll keep out the outside noises. You put that over your door, put that over your window, or you could build like a, a sound booth around you and just kind of pull these curtains down, depending on where you're recording from. Of course, get rid of all your distractions. <laughs> get rid of your, your, no, don't get rid of your kids, but you know, you know, call, call their favorite aunt or something and give, give her some candy money. And uh, your pets, your dogs will bark. Your cats might jump on your, your keyboard. Stop the recording in the middle of the interview. That happens. Cats like to sleep on keyboards, I hear. I don't know. Um, you tell your friends, don't come over right now. I'm, I'm kind of busy doing something. Uh, if you have roommates, your partner, spouses, just let everybody know. Shut off the TV in your room, in the other room. Just, you know, make sure you do that. Close the door, obviously. So some gear that you need, um, you know, I'm working for Focus, right? I'd love to say, go buy all of our products, right? I recommend that you start off and get your proof of concept. Spend $50 on a mic like a Samson Q2U or Audio-Technica ATR2100, 50 to $65, and you have a USB interface or, uh, built into it. Not the best in the world, not the greatest, not the worst. Uh, but the really cool thing about those two mics in particular that I mentioned is they also have an XLR uh, output on the back of them. So you can plug that into an audio interface and you can increase your sound quality. It'll sound a lot better once you plug it into that interface. You'll get more headroom, you'll get um, a lower, lower noise floor, and you'll get more gain available to you. Um, some, of the, some of the things, you know, it, you can only really work, use one of them at a time. So if it's more than one person on your show, you're kind of uh, stuck either sharing the mic, which gets really hard in editing because we might have a soft talker and a loud talker. So you're going to end up splitting things up and that's going to end up being a headache. Or you're just going to, uh, you know, have to, you're going to have to go around that some way uh, to have more than one person on your show. They're a little bit noisy from what I've heard. And, and that could be because of the form factor. You know, a microphone is only so big. Um, you have to fit a lot of components in there, which could, uh, you know, you could have some uh, crosstalk, noise, distortion, things like that. Uh, not saying that is what's going to happen, but, you know, the possibility is there. It's a very small device and very inexpensive. And our mothers all said, you get what you pay for, right? Everybody knows this. Um, so audio interfaces, that's how you improve your sound. And you know what? This is a really cool idea. The Rodecaster Pro, I got uh, got to say a lot of, um, this was launched, I think at the beginning of the year, it was designed, it was the first interface designed just for podcasters. Uh, it's built with podcasters in mind. I've heard very mixed reviews on this. I haven't used it myself. I don't have an opinion on it, but it's expensive. It's, it starts at about 900 bucks. So, you know, you see where your budget's at. I don't have $900 to invest in one, but that's me. Um, so speaking of improving your sound quality, once again, sorry, this is that part in the middle where I got you and I'm going to do a little bit of a pitch here, but it'll be relevant. I promise you. Um, I work at focus, right? I'm, I'm a podcaster and I use a Scarlet for my podcast and I've met a lot of podcasters over the last two years and overwhelmingly most of them use a Scarlet uh, from people that are interviewing Fortune 500 uh, CEOs, uh, professional athletes, 
um, everybody. Um, every a lot of people are using these. Oh, down to people that are just having a, a show that gets two, three listeners, and they're very happy with that. So everybody in between, people are making millions of dollars on their podcast using a Scarlet, and I have names that I can name and shows that I can point you to that that's indisputable. Um, right now, Scarlet is in its third generation. How many how many of you have heard of Focusrite Scarlet or have one? How many have one? Yeah, they're they're everywhere, and you know why? They are the world's best-selling USB audio interface. Uh, we just launched our third generation, and uh, the combination of all three generations, we sold over three million of those units worldwide. And that's that's a lot of them. Um, you know, that that's a lot of little red boxes out there, and they last forever. They sound incredible, and they're just high-quality units. Um, you have six different models in the current range. Uh, you can have one, four, or eight mic pre's, um, depending on the numbers of guests on your show. I'd avoid eight because that's just going to be loud and that's wrangling cats. And we don't really want to do that, right? Um, the superior sound quality makes sure that you're going to sound your best on your show. And it's really easy to use. I, everybody that has a Scarlet knows they're quite easy to use and they've only gotten easier in the new generation. Uh, we have a great new onboarding tool. You plug your unit in, it takes you directly into the registration process and then gives you all your free software. So you have everything right there immediately just handed right to you. Um, it has, so, um, do you know, our, the history of Focusrite goes back to like the early 80s um, uh, with Rupert Neve and uh, started the company uh, building consoles. And uh, we, we, we took the sound of that console, you know, he, he didn't have the company long. Our, our current chairman, uh, Phil Dudridge, uh, took over the company uh, shortly after that. Uh, and built these studio consoles. And that sound was sought after for a long, long time. So it, it trickled down into the ISA uh, mic prees and the air mode, you have that really cool high end, which just kind of lifts up your voice. Um, we've modeled that into these Scarlets now. It gives a little bit of an EQ boost around 4K, which, uh, which makes it sound a little bit more like those ISAs. Gives it a little bit more character, a little bit more, um, a little bit more breath in your voice. Um, a little bit more presence things like that. What else do you need? So I, of those six interfaces, there's two of them that I recommend the most to podcasters um, for very specific reasons. Uh, if you have one or two people on your podcast, a Scarlet 2i2 is perfect for you. Uh, you plug it in, it gets into your computer. It's very affordable at $159. And it has two mic pre's with that switchable air mode that I said. Uh, air mode might not be for everybody. Try it out with your voice. Um, some people like it, some people don't. It depends on your microphone as well. Um, another one that I really like to recommend is the Scarlett 18i8. Um, it has four mic pre's uh, and it has internal loopback, which is really cool. Uh, internal loopback uh, is if you take a Skype interview. Do we have anybody do their interviews via Skype? All right, I'll, I'll touch more on that in a minute, but uh, that's a way to do it. You can internally get that in there so you can record it as a separate track now. Um, it's very easy to set up, takes about a minute. Um, I sat down with it just to see if I could try to figure it out. I had one of our product specialists and just in case I couldn't, in case it was too complicated, but I was amazed that it was like, that's it. It was just stupid, simple to set up. So it's really great if you want to get, uh, your, uh, Skype or zoom calls in, um, some microphones, Does it, uh, everybody, uh, has a favorite microphone. Everybody's microphone sounds different with their voice as well. Um, some of my favorites and podcaster favorites. Uh, Heil Sound, the PR40 or their 30, they both sound great. Uh, the Shure SM7B, I see probably more than any other professional podcast microphone. The the RE20, like that's that's another really great broadcast and podcast microphone. And, and then um, more budget friendly, MXL makes a really great mic called the BCD1. And there the list goes on. There's a lot more out there. Rode makes a really great uh, podcaster microphone as well. Um, you know, there's plenty of brands here that make great dynamic microphones for podcasting. So there's, of course, some other things you're going to need, some some basics to get started, uh, such as a boom arm. You know, uh, boom arms are a lot easier to use than a mic stand. I feel like I kick the mic stand a lot, and it's great for music because you can set it up by your amp, by your drums, whatever. You, you don't move it, but you're moving around when you talk, you know. Um, I'm surprised I haven't hit this microphone yet, but I would have kicked it because my feet are just going over here. Uh, but you clip that onto your desk and you can move it around. You're very comfortable. 
it's been a broadcast tool for years and podcasters love them as well. It's no surprise that it's been adopted by podcasters. Shock mounts are important. I didn't think they were, I didn't have one, but again, we're animated when we talk, right? We, 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 we move our hands, we tap the table, we drop things on the table and that'll translate into sound. You, we all know that vibration sounds are vibrations. So you vibrate the table, of course, you're going to hear it come through your mic. The shock mount tries to avoid some of that. Um, pop filter. I, I read, I, I, I can't tell you whose website it was because honestly, I just don't remember, but nothing sounds more unprofessional than saying the word professional with a pop in it. So get a pop filter um, and you will be glad that you did because if you try to edit out a pop or a plosive, uh, good luck. Um, you're going to have to... You're a better engineer than I am. I have no patience for those types of things. Um, you're going to need a pair of headphones. And make sure you get comfortable headphones because you're going to be editing and you're going to be recording your podcast, which, you know, uh, I've gone from 10-minute podcasts up to hour and a half. So be, make sure the, the headphones that you're wearing are comfortable. These ones feel pretty good, actually. I don't know who makes these, but uh, they actually feel pretty nice. Um, another thing you're going to need, um, you know, maybe not need, but a pair of speakers. Uh, give your ears a little less fatigue and listen to them from a different source. We all, we all know that you test your, your tracks on different, um, different speakers, right? Uh, different sources or different, um, I'm sorry, you listen on different speakers, different types of monitors, you listen in the car. Uh, do that, do the same thing with your podcast. Make sure it still sounds good. Uh, and, and also just give your ears a break. And, you know, you're going to need all the cables, um, you know, we all, we all know what cables we need. Usually they come in the box or the box says what you need. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're all smart enough to figure out all the cabling situations. So there is a great debate in podcasting between condenser and dynamic microphones. Um, the, uh, we all know condensers have great high frequency response. They're much more sensitive than a dynamic, um, which is really good when you're recording a guitar you know, a beautiful acoustic guitar or some stringed instruments or vocals when you're singing. A condenser mic is great for that, but you can pick up a lot of the, the high frequency tones in your room. If you have an air conditioning on, you might hear the air conditioning, the hiss from that. Uh, if someone turns on the water in the other room, that could get picked up. Mouth noises. When you talk, your mouth makes noises um, that you really don't want to have picked up uh, and put onto your podcast. So another thing that you'd have to edit out um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't use a condenser for, for podcasting, um, but obviously do what you need to do. Uh, whatever mic works for you and your budget and your voice. Uh, just just think about that when you're when you're making a choice. Dynamic mics. Sorry for shouting. Um, they have a great frequency response at the levels that you need to have them at. Uh, they're great for broad, broadcast and podcasting. They were tried and true. Um, it doesn't enhance that high sound. It doesn't have that high sound boost. They're not quite as sensitive uh, in those ranges, um, and they're trusted for years by uh, podcast and broadcasting professionals. And really quickly, when you're choosing, uh, you know, try try to get just a standard cardioid mic. Uh, they're best for podcasting because of their rear fre frequency. Resp uh, sorry, they're best for podcasting because of their rear rejection, um, especially when you're interviewing somebody. You don't want the the bleed to come uh, in either mic. Um, that can be a little bit of a headache. I had. Uh, a weird situation that happened to me where it sounded like I had a really strange reverb um, because I uh, on my mic and I, I couldn't figure out why until I started muting the mics and doing some editing and realized that the per I was using a condenser because it's what was available at the time. It was kind of an impromptu thing. Um, and I was getting the reflection off the glass behind me. So I was getting my own reverb in the, in the room. It was just a tiny little office room too. Super cardioid, even better. But your mic technique, it has to be spot on and you're going to have to pay attention to the mic. And one of the better things on a podcast is pay attention to your content. If you're telling a story or talking, you don't want to be paying attention um, to where your mic is placed. Like, you know, even with this mic right here, it's kind of small and I'm, I'm guessing it's probably a super cardioid from the, the form factor of it. But, you know, keep that. That's one thing to just keep in mind when you're when you're choosing your microphone. Um, like I was saying before, uh, it was great that Steve Jobs uh, told people about GarageBand. Um, because GarageBand is free and it, a lot of podcasts are recorded in GarageBand. Um, two weeks ago, I had a, a little bit of a technical glitch in my computer um, and I couldn't use what I wanted to record. Um, it was kind of a, a situation that was out of my control, which, you know, as an audio engineer, we're, we're workaround experts. That's what we do, right? We do a workaround. So unfortunately, in this case, the workaround was to record in GarageBand. Um, but it's free. That's a good thing. It was on my Mac and I, I did that. And 
it wasn't I didn't use my Pro Tools or uh, or Hindenburg, which is the DAW I'll, I'll talk about in just a second. Um, Audacity, it's another one, it's free. Um, it has a little bit of uh, track count limitations, but um, if you're just one, two people, you're gonna be just fine using Audacity. It's free for Mac or PC users, so it doesn't matter if which computer you have, you don't have to buy a new computer. Um, of course, Pro Tools, which is what I, you know, I was trained in Pro Tools, like a lot of us probably have been, and that's what I used at first. Um, it's quite a bit of overkill, though, for a podcast, in my opinion. Um, I still use it sometimes, but, um, Logic as well, if that's your DAW of choice, of course. Um, Cubase, Ableton, um, you could do it. Um, I don't know if you would or why. Why? Um, there's other options out there, but there's another company called Hindenburg, and I really wish, uh, I, I have a missed opportunity here. I should have probably thrown uh, a sample of what that looks like, but it's a really simple uh, way to record your podcast and edit your podcast. Um, it doesn't have a mix window. Uh, it automatically uh, levels all of your tracks when you drop them in. So it, go, it, it normalizes it to normal broadcast level, which is really cool. It'll, you can drop in uh, music tracks. Um, you can have an EDM track and a classical track, and it'll normalize those based on their average level. So you're not going to have shock when you go from your musical intro to your guest to a, a different type of music to another guest. It's all going to be the same level, and it exports automatically at the broadcast levels that you're looking for really like that. That's what I've started using. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, it's a very small company. I believe they're Danish. Danish? Yeah, they're Danish company. They're really good people. They're very responsive when you reach out to them. So, you know, I, I recommend it. They have a free trial. So check out Hindenburg.com. Like the, like the disaster, although the app doesn't crash quite as much as the Blint does. Um, remote interviews. You mentioned that you record your interviews with Skype. Uh, that is great. Um, especially with the loopback feature in the new Scarlets. Um, but it is a workaround. Like, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us use, use it um, for phone calls and for conferences. And that's what it was made for. And that's what it's great for. But um, did we know, anybody know what, um, where it records, what level it records at? It's like, uh, I think it's 32K, which is just really weird. And it gets glitchy and it, it artifacts a little bit and it doesn't sound great. It's not made for... It's not made for broadcast. It's not high, high res audio. Um, so it is a workaround, but it's free, right? It's free. Like I said, budget friendly. That's where we're all after. There are other uh, fairly uh, budget friendly options out there. Um, I have some friends that have a company called Squadcast, another very small startup. They're a Silicon Valley startup. Um, and it's fantastic. Uh, and, and the cool thing about this is, yes, it is something that you have to pay for, but you can pay a small hourly rate or you can pay a monthly rate for unlimited use. And they charge like $5 an hour. Uh, you know, you buy a bundle for like two, three hours and you, you know, give them 15, 20 bucks and there you go. You, you can do your interviews. And one of the cool things, they're really good people. You run out of hours, they're not going to cut you off. They're going to let you go over until you're done with your interview. So you're not going to lose that magic that you're capturing. You're not going to have to be, oh, let me re-up my card. I got to hold on, pause, pause that thought. I got to, I got to put more money in the meter. You don't have to do that. These are really good guys. And Again, um, their tech support is unbeatable. Uh, I had one issue with them, which was user error, honestly. Um, as most tech support issues are, if anybody's done tech support, it's generally user error, uh, in my case at least. Um, and I, I got on their chat window, of course, just pissed off like you always are when you know you did it right, but no, I didn't do it right. Um, uh, and their CEO got on chat and was like, hey, how can I help you? And, and I was like, oh, hey, how are you doing, man? And uh, of course, I know uh, Rock really well. Um, him and Zach are great guys. I've known them from uh, some of the events that I've attended for podcasters. And, uh, and actually, there they are. That's the whole team on the screen. On, the, uh, on your left, that's uh, Zach, their um, CTO. And the top is their CAO, Chief Audio Officer. What a cool job. He's an audio engineer, audio engineering society member. Uh, Vince is a really cool guy. And then, of course, Rock Felder. Um, so then hosting. You got your show, you recorded some episodes, you want the world to hear it. You want to get on Spotify, Google, you want to get on um, uh, Apple Podcasts. How did, I, how did I space on that one? That's the most popular. Um, Libsyn, they're the first ones. Um, and of course, there's a, a number of them. There's more every, every day. You're seeing a lot more companies like this pop up. So contact whichever one works for you. Uh, the one I chose is as simple as I met someone here last year. He came up to me, gave me his business card, and I said, yes, I will work with you. And uh, I work with Simplecast, and I'm pleased with their results. They give you great analytics. 
Um, they give you great numbers to look at and uh, you know what you're doing. It's because of that that I know that the uh, downloaders on our podcast is in the top 20% of all podcasts. So our, we're, doing fair, we're doing something just right because I can see it in the analytics. So RSS feeds. Does anyone know what RSS feed stands for? RSS. It's really simple syndication. Great, right? That's brilliant. Um, why is that impo important to podcasters? Uh, you own it. You can't be censored. You can say whatever you want on your RSS feed and you can never be taken down. Um, I have a bit of an example here. Not supporting this example at all. Um, just an example. Um, everybody know this guy? Looks like one of Will Sasso's characters from one of his shows that he did. Alex Jones, very controversial figure. He's been removed. He's been delisted from all of the podcast platforms. But his podcast continues to get downloads, millions of downloads every month because he owns his RSS feed. He puts that out through his website. You can still listen to his podcast, download his content, and he makes a lot of money off of his show. He's still making money, still making shows, and still has listeners. And there you go. You've got a podcast. Now what do you do? You got to get that promoted. Make sure you have a website. You have to brand yourself, brand your podcast, have a website, get on every social media platform, all of them. Um, be only active on one if you want to, but you know, share on Twitter that you're on Facebook, share on Facebook that you're on Twitter, vice versa, including LinkedIn. People find a lot of, a lot of podcasts on LinkedIn. That's a, a great resource. Um, email newsletters, get a subscription base, let people know what you're doing, where you are, uh, just interact with your, with your audience. It's, it's a good way, like companies like myself, we do giveaways through um, Podcasters email newsletters. That's a great way to interact with your fans and let them know that you appreciate them. Let, let them know that, that you're there. And that's how you're gonna get and keep fans is interacting with them. They want, they like you, they're there for you. You're the personality that, that, they, that they came from. Um, some other things you can do, custom swag, uh, starts with a business card. And get a business card that, one thing I recommend, and I, I got some great advice early in my career, is get a business card that's not all black because someone might want to write some notes on it. You know, just a little tidbit. So beat the odds. Have you ever heard of pod fading? Um, that's what happens when uh, seven episodes is, if you make it to seven episodes, you're probably going to make it to 20 episodes. If you make it to 20 episodes, you'll probably make it to 50. If you make it to 50, you're doing great. You're going to be, you're a podcaster. Um, so in April to, to June of this year, 20% of all podcasts produced a fresh episode. It's a very low number of podcasts. So that's a lot of pod fading. That's how we get the 250,000 is the number of podcasts. Um, only about 132,000 of the, the, the number I got here. See, I, I went 700,000, 250,000, 540,000. This is another source that I got. So it's highly disputed, as I said, the number of shows. Um, but that's it. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the Focus Right Pro podcast. Um, we launched it in uh, July of this year. Right now, as of yesterday, we have 10 episodes live interviewing uh, influential guests in pro, in, pro, audio, pro audio and other industry peers. Um, uh, people that have nothing to do with audio, G Technology, make hard drives. I had a great conversation with them on the podcast. Uh, yesterday, the executive director from uh, AES, she's not an audio person, she's a business person, but she had a lot of great things to say about all of you. She really did. This show, she's done incredible things for each and every one of you, especially in the education field. And I had a great talk with her along with uh, my co-host, uh, Ted. Um, if you want to listen to that podcast, you can open up your phone right now and you can download that on Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or on our RSS feed on pro.focusright.com. We got it right there for you so you can find it. And if you'd like, I'm probably going to be uh, doing some episodes shortly. We're in booth 632. You can see on the little map there where you're going to be. Um, one more thing before you all go. Uh, right here, Hannah has some folders uh, with a lot of the information that I have. And also, if you'd like a copy of this presentation, take, take a photo of the screen. There's a link there. You can download, download this entire presentation. Um, if you have any questions for me, please email me, daniel.hugley at focusright.com. And uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day at AES.